Hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of Pod Strickland. I'm your host, Schwinny Poo, and this is episode 263. I am joined on a chilly uh, Tuesday morning by my co host, Stacy. That is at StacyPat89. Stacy, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm fucking miserable and pissed. Uh, tired of basketball. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that, uh, and we're going to talk all about it, uh, but before we get started, I have to make a few announcements, the first being that the Strickland has an Instagram. Give it a follow. It's at the strict.land on Instagram. Uh, we're putting out all kinds of new content on there, so if you can give us a follow, that would be a huge help. The Strickland also has a YouTube channel, which you may be watching this podcast on. If you are, please hit the like button and then subscribe to the channel. That would be a huge help to us. So if you have not subscribed, please do so now. We also, Strickland, has a Patreon. You can subscribe to it. There are a number of tiers. There's a $6 tier that gets you access to Pod Strickland that I host every Friday with Prez. You also get access to the Strickland mailbag that comes out every other week, hosted by Andrew Steele, a.k.a. Doug, along with Dallas Amico, who is back from fighting the good fight against the powers that be in California. There are, oh, and you also get access to the Strickland Discord where the conversation never stops. There are further tiers. There's a $9 tier that gets you access to Strickland Roll, my solo pod, where I rant and rave about the Knicks even more. You also get access to wonderful weekly articles by Matthew Miranda, one of the best in the business. There are further tiers. There's a $15 tier, $30 tier, $50 tier, and $100 tier. This comes with a variety of additional benefits like listening in to pod recordings, merchandise discounts, and even potentially co hosting a podcast alongside yours truly one day. Whether you choose to subscribe or not, none of this would be possible without you. So, um, without further ado, let's get started. The Knicks lost yesterday, 123-121, to the Raptors in overtime. Um, they did win three straight prior to that, beating whew, Washington, Detroit, and some other team I can't remember right now. I'll top my head. Uh, the Pacers, that's who it was. Uh, they lost to the Bucks last Monday. So, uh, you know, mixed, mixed little structure, but... The key is not stacking losses and stacking wins. So as annoying as yesterday's game was, uh, Nick still remained in a pretty good position overall. Uh, I'm going to be honest. Like, we'll talk about the insane minutes stuff that Tibbs is doing right now. And I can understand it to an extent, but I think he's taking it to a very dangerous extreme already. Um, but... I'm not really interested in blaming individual players for the loss. I'm not really interested in discussing Tibbs' rotations. I actually think Tibbs, all things considered, coach, um, I would have liked to see him not trap Scotty Barnes and send as much help as he was because I had no concern. You know, Contrary to what Scotty Barnes thinks, he didn't do fucking shit yesterday. He definitely didn't do anything on R.J. Barrett. So I didn't think that we needed to help off him as much as he did. And that actually, I thought, keyed a lot of... Um, good possessions for the Raptors late in that game when they made their comeback. But uh, all I really want to talk about is I think the refing, the officiating in this game was a, a joke. I thought it was atrocious. I thought the fact that the Knicks were even in position to win the game, considering the whistle that was being called the entire night, was a credit to them and a credit to their uh, mental fortitude, the resilience they showed, especially on the second of a back-to-back. But Schwinn, they still had opportunities, even if the refs are fucking them constantly. Yeah, and I just I, you can't use that as an excuse. You're not allowed. The refs are about if the refs gave every call to the Raptors, you're not allowed to have that. You you ha- you're still supposed to win. And I actually oh. like I ge- I generally like I do think like generally speaking, officiating like how much it tilts a game is usually like not. It's not as much as like people will argue, like fans will argue, right? I, I just yesterday was like it was actually that bad, and I and I I take obviously what you're saying you're being sarcastic but like like i generally tend to feel that way even if i will say the officiating is bad yesterday's not one of those days yesterday was like i i genuinely don't know coaching in a game like that playing in a game like that like it, it makes your life so hard as a player and as a coach to figure out how to adjust to that and like it was that there were sequences that were just so ridiculous like there was one Randall gets a steal. He's out on the break. I think Siakam fouled him in the contest. I'm okay with that no call. Brunson has a follow-up. Ananobi literally knocks into him. And, like, it's a no call. There's another one. Brunson drives. 
clearly gets fouled by Scotty Barnes. No call. On then RJ's dunk, they were holding him down by right. the fucking shoulder. Yeah, and, like, and it's game. If he makes yeah, the free throw, well, it's he makes the free throw is a big caveat there. But yeah, like given that he's in there, that's not an RJ specific thing. But yeah, you know, and it's and then it's like and then you had the uh and then obviously the one I was just talking about where Brunson gets knocked down, it's a clear foul, they don't call it. It's a three on one fast break the other way. Quickly makes a great play. He basically cuts off both the passes, so he forces Scotty to take a shot. And since Scotty Barnes is a fucking joke of a player, he gets stuffed by Emmanuel quickly at the rim. He catches the ball. His foot is clearly out of bounds. Like, it's obvious. And there's two refs standing right there, one on the baseline and one on the sideline, staring at this. Nobody calls it. He gets the ball, lays it back in. That's a massive swing. That's like, one, it should have been a foul for us either way, so there shouldn't have ever been a fast break. And then two... You give a bucket that shouldn't have been a bucket after a great defensive play by quickly. It, it, that entire stretch was a joke. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the last play of the game, you know, you've got RJ comes down, dunks. And it like not only did he grab his shoulder, he also hit him up top on the arm. So, like, he fouled him twice on the play. There's a ref, again, Scott Foster, who decided that he had to, like, you know, he must have had a lot of money laying riding on this one. Um, he, had, he, he was on the baseline staring at it. You've got another ref on the sideline looking at it and you've got the third ref trailing the play. So he's got the whole play in front of him. If none of those guys can see that, then why even have refs? And, and then the other piece of this, that like the thing, like, so, uh, you know, there were people who be like, Oh, well you was obstructed, blah, blah. Scott Foster made a call uh, right before that, the possession before actually, where uh, Brunson takes a shot. He missed it. Randall gets called for a loose ball foul. Was it a loose ball foul? Yeah, probably. I also think on that play, Fred Van Vliet's pushing Randall before he pushes Scotty Barnes, but I kind of understand why you'd call the foul on, on Randall. But, like, Scott Foster, he was the furthest ref from the play. He's got, like, six guys in between him and where Randall and all this shit is happening underneath the rim. He's the one that caused that. So, like, I, I it was it was such an egregiously officiated game yesterday. And I know the numbers, I think it ended up being, like, the Raptors had 40 free throws and we had 32. That really is not going to tell you the, the, the story. Yeah, the not game. when one team has Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson and R.J. Barrett, and uh, the other team is doesn't, right? I mean, Siakam draws a lot of fouls. He gets to the paint a lot. But that's the Knicks, that's the Knicks game. And, um, you know, it, it's... Um, I, I first of all, I think that there's probably some mitigating factors. I think the Knicks are a difficult team to officiate because they have a lot of players that do see content. I think Randall is probably, along with a guy like Zion Williamson, um, you know, maybe Cat Joel Embiid. Those guys are just very tough to officiate. There's always going to be contact on every. So I get it. That's a difficult player to officiate. Brunson does some cheap shit sometimes to draw fouls. He's tough to officiate. Uh, and RJ tries to to draw a lot of fouls too, so I get. But on the other end, it's the, the other the other end. You have, you, I mean, what is Fred Van Fleet if not a foul merchant, right? How much cheap shit was he doing on both ends? Uh, Siakam just runs and Aah! like he's get, it's like he's having a fucking orgasm on every drive. Like it's 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 disgusting to watch. Um, and, and it's and, not the and first. They, they also they also had that one. So, like it, it's crazy the amount of shitty calls that that were made in this game against the Knicks. They had the one where Gary Trent Jr. pulls up and he literally jumps forward into quickly. Yeah. He makes the shot, which is fine. Like, he makes the shot, so count that. He gets a free throw out of it, too, which is and a that's joke. that's been a point of emphasis for... That's Great. been a point of emphasis, and it always seems to... And, um, but, I mean, yes, like... And the then they reviewed the one in overtime. I could not believe that. I, I don't see how... They were... Fred Van Vliet jumps elbow first into Brunson's head, Okay. They call a foul on that on the floor, which in real time I thought was an atrocious call on the floor. They call they review it. On the review, you can see that he jumps into into Brunson with his elbow leading, right? Into his face. But you also see that Scotty Barnes is setting the most illegal screen ever. And that's a screen that I've seen Hartenstein get called for multiple fouls on this year, like at least three or four or five times. And they and they review it and they say the call stands. Like I can understand if you review it and you say, it's not an offensive foul, but it's not a defensive foul, so it's just Raptors ball side out. I can I can understand that. I'm okay with that. To call to review it and be like the call stands. That I'm sorry. Like, how do you review that? And 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 not like I, I genuinely can't even wrap my brain around this. There's no way you can review that call, and and come to the conclusion that it was a it was a defensive foul. 
Like, there, it's just not. Like, there's there's nothing there that you can call for that. And I'm sorry. Like, the fact that Scott Foster is still officiating games in this league is a fucking joke. This guy clearly bet on NBA games. It's a very obvious thing. Unless, you know, he's calling he, – Tim Donahue was calling this guy more than his bookie. So, you know, look, I, I don't know. Maybe they're having, like, a very – maybe their relationship is really special. But, like, I don't think you're, you're – as somebody who has, uh, you know, dabbled in gambling, let me just tell somebody, you probably don't call anybody more than your bookie, all right? Not your mom, not your girlfriend, not your best friend, not your dog, nobody, okay? You're, you're calling your bookie more than anybody. So for anybody calling them Tim to, or to be talking to Scott Foster before and after every time he's calling his bookie, it says something. And the fact that the NBA still has this guy fucking – like, if you want to brush it under the rug so it goes away, fine. Get this fucking guy out of the league. He's a joke. He's an absolute joke. He had it out for the Knicks yesterday, and it was obvious from the beginning of the game. From the start of the game till the end of the game, he was on absolute bullshit. That entire crew is a joke. They should never officiate on their Knicks game again. They shouldn't officiate an NBA game again. And he should never – he should be out of a job. That guy is a pathetic loser piece of shit. And he is – like the fact that he's still calling NBA games is a total black mark on the league. And it it's insulting to me as a fan to be told that this guy won – didn't bet on games, and two, he's completely fit for purpose. I've never watched a game that Scott Foster calls and have come away not thinking about the fact that Scott Foster officiated the game. That's a problem. That's a bad, bad official. He's a bad, bad, he's a terrible, terrible referee. He should never officiate another game in this league, but he's going to. And he'll probably officiate another 15 Knicks games this year, and I'm probably going to want to fucking blow my brains out after each one. Yeah, there was also, there, I mean, there were just multiple drives where, like, Brunson gets hit in the face by Van Fleet, gets called for a foul. Um, it's just, but it's it's every game now. I mean, how many of these games, it's like, it's the same thing. The Knicks build a small a lead. They, they led the entire second half, basically until until the, the last minute. And then RJ tied with the dunk. That should have been an and one. And it's the same recipe, right? It's, I can't even, I, I can't, like to your point, I can't get that much on Tibbs. Um, I personally think that the offense is right now a little bit too. There's a little bit too much RJ Barrett, particularly when the bench is on there. Um, but I don't like. I don't like what he's doing. I, I don't understand the bench offense at all. Like, I, and I. So this is like I get like Deuce is in his own head, and he's just not doing anything. So I I get like there's going to be some level of natural struggle there, but you have quickly an RJ on the floor. He's having Deuce bring the ball up for some reason half the time. More than half the time, it seems quickly like. Quickly barely yeah. touched the ball. I mean, yeah, quickly and, barely. And, and, and then Andre yeah. had more shot attempts than Julius Randle in the first half last year. I never thought I would say that and be unhappy about it last year, at least. But RJ took 11 shots in the first half. He's 311. Randle was four for eight. Now, credit the Raptors for getting the ball out of Randle's hands, and Randle made the right decision. But the bench, I think the bench offense, with the way like Tibbs wants one of the starters out there, and he wants them running the set. I think when McBride brings the ball up, it's because they're going to give it to, to Barrett. But I just, I'm not sure RJ should be that guy. I think it should, I mean, ideally it's probably one of Brunson or Randall. And that's what he was doing when RJ was hurt. He would keep one of Brunson or Randall out there, especially when it's clear the bench couldn't do anything with that too big lineup with with um, with both of them out. And I think what, like he, he wants a designated bench babysitter from the starting lineup. And, and, it's, and it's usually an offensive player because McBride and Quickly are good on defense. Um, I, I agree with that. I just don't think it should be RJ. I actually, my my take on this is I actually would like that rotation to change. So what I would like to happen is what, what's been happening, right, is he brings Quickly in for RJ. And then Quickly, RJ, Grimes, or sorry, Quickly, Brunson, R, uh, Grimes, close the first quarter. And then RJ comes back in either sometimes very late in the first, but usually at the start of the second. I actually, and, and Brunson goes out then too. So it's usually, you know, RJ, Quick, Deuce, Obi, um, and uh, shit, why well, can't I think of the name? And uh, Hartenstein. Sorry, Jesus, sorry. Um, that's usually what, what that, but I, what I actually would like to see is Grimes come back in with that group and have an RJ play the entire first quarter. And I know that's like, like, I know there are people that are like, well, you have three shock readers. You should split them up. 
fine. You, maybe maybe that's true. Right but now like, I think we have two. That's my point. Yeah, also, I, but... I I also I actually think we have four. I just think we're leaning on RJ way too much. Um, I think if we have a third, it's not RJ. It's the guy I assume you're talking about. But also, I think I'd rather just we we can play RJ or, or we can play Randall or Brunson with them. So why not Randall? Now we can't because of Obi. So fine. So play Brunson with the bench, right? And, and let quickly take his minutes with the starting lineup. Um, I, I just um, I, I I don't like running the offense through RJ Barrett right now. Um, I like getting him the ball off of side action. I like him running side pick and rolls. But I like him as the secondary creator. He can even take the most shots. But I just don't like um, him initiating and trying to create against the set defense right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm not in love with that. But I also think that, like, you when you don't have – if, like, Deuce is not going to give you anything, like, you're going to have some of those possessions. And, like, to be honest, yesterday I thought Brunson had a bad game. So That's good. That's fair. So I'm – like, I and I thought RJ actually – like, his first half wasn't great. But I didn't I didn't actually hate the shots he was taking. Like, would I have liked to see him pass a few more times? Sure. But I actually thought for the most part his shots were good. And that's why he's I like... not a good mid range shooter. And he takes, he's been taking a lot of them. I get that he's trying to add that to his game. But I, on that lineup, I would have preferred quickly to. I think that quickly will get RJ better shots than RJ will get for himself. That's yeah, I agree with that. Um, I also just think the way we're running the offense, like, there's just not a lot of assist opportunities for anybody. Like, it's just not. It, it's just. just... It's just what it is. Like, I don't think this is like, like, I I think I've seen enough now of this team where, and I'm not, I'm not here to say whether this is right or wrong. This is the choice. and This is how Tibbs is running it. But like, you're just not going to have high assist totals running the offense the way we do, regardless of whether it's, you're running it through Brunson or Randall. They've had a, or they've had a few, they've had a few big assist games. What was also really, I think at the end of regulation, Quentin Grimes had three shot attempts. He finished an overtime game with five shot attempts. Yeah, it's just uh, not enough. Like but, these guys are not like you're is, not getting him involved. That enough. is a complete failure of the offense because he is he is he is really your only he's the only guy him and Brunson are the only guys shooting well above average from three. We all think quickly is a good shooter. Randall's capable, but you need to like it's like it's like you know, if you look in the at, at halftime and Christian McCaffrey is two two receptions and two carries, right, for the, the Niners. You'd be like, what's the game plan? Like, well, that's, that's just what, that's, a, that's saying, just a classic uh, Kyle Shanahan galaxy <laughs> brain game plan. And I'm not saying Grimes is the equivalent of Kyle McCaffrey, but the, or Christian McCaffrey. Excuse me. <laughs> um, but um, the point is, like that, and it's frustrating because we always seem to lose these games on on three pointers. We shot nine for 31. 31 shots is not a low total, yeah. but Toronto didn't shoot that well. But they took 44 threes. So just and, just uh, just real quick. Th- um, according to Basketball Reference, the Knicks rank 26th in assists per hundred possessions. Um, they are they they average 22.7. Dallas is tied with them actually, also at 22.7. Then it's Detroit 22.4, Orlando 22.4, Houston 22.2. Like again, so there are good teams and Dallas. Right? Yeah, and I mean the, the there are ISO creator in the league probably. Right, and like so, I mean Oklahoma City's 23rd. They're, they've actually been pretty good this year. Um, the Clippers are 25th. They've been up and down. Obviously, their top level is great. But, like, the point is, like, I just – I don't think I, – I, I don't – like, look, it is what it is. I think Tibbs is doing a fine job with his team. Not great, not amazing, but, like, fine. And I get that offensively, like, he's he's never going to – like, you're going to be a kind of stagnant iso team with him as, as your coach. It's just what it is. I just think there is a better balance to be found. And I do think once Brunson, like it seems like when Brunson, Brunson and Randall have kind of had it going offensively anyway, since the start of the year, but once RJ kind of found a rhythm, it feels like it's become really, really a three headed monster. And everybody else kind of just like lives off the scraps. And that's frustrating to me, not because I think like Grimes, I don't think Grimes needs to be, you know, like some, 20 usage guy right now. I don't think quickly needs to be he's 25. The only, usage. He's but the he, only he, consistent catch and shoot guy besides Brunson right now. Right, right. And but I'm saying like it's not it's not even about the specific usage to me. It's just like they are so uninvolved. Like Grimes is so uninvolved at times. And and to be uh, to be fair to Tibbs, um, you know, look, he always talks about like getting getting into the paint, make the right rim read, spray out shooters. I thought like I thought Brunson missed a good half dozen good kick out opportunities yesterday to Grimes quickly, RJ, whoever. Um, I just thought he had, he had blinders on yesterday. And I think 
him he and does Fred, a lot. It's yeah. just more noticeable when he's missing shots. And yeah. and I think him and Van Vliet had a little thing going on, and he got sucked into that. And I think that influenced a lot of his decision making yesterday. That's part of the game, and it's part of just you know, look, you can't expect. Look at the week Brunson had, right? Like, okay, he's a lot of bad game. It, it, it's okay. It's fine. It happens. Um, but it is frustrating, and it feels like Grimes is always the guy that pays for that, right? When like when guys. When, when guys aren't making the right reads, he always seems to be the odd man out offensively in that starting group. Um, and, and I think when Quickly comes in and he plays with them, it's the same deal, right? It actually almost becomes more extreme with how much Brunson and Randall do uh, when RJ goes out first and then you have IQ and Grimes out with them. Uh, and, and I think like this is why I kind I almost want to reverse that because we, like, we didn't see a lot of it, obviously, because it was only a three-game stretch where we didn't have Brunson or RJ, but I liked, and I, I thought Grimes showed, you know, the, he had a, he was up and down, right? Against Dallas, he was awesome. Then against uh, the Spurs, he kind of like, he bricked early and he just kind of went into a, his hole. And then against Houston, he had it going again. But like, I like that fit with IQ and Grimes offensively. I think there's a natural, like, uh, what do you call it? Synergy between them because IQ is easily in my, in my opinion, he's our best drive and kick player. And Grimes is obviously our best like beneficiary of that. And um, I also think like there's an, like look, you have two other plus passers on that lineup. Right. You have Hardenstein and OB. So, and Hardenstein, I, I'll say I, I didn't, I thought he played well yesterday. Yeah. I, didn't I thought he's, I think he's played well the last three games. Actually. I thought he played well against Washington. He has and, clear limitations, but I think he's finding a way to get involved, and I think um, I think he's playing with a little more confidence. So. Yeah, I, th- I don't know what happened between the Pacers game and the and the. I mean, it, game. maybe that that thing where that sequence, right, where he airballed like it was the it was the Bucks, right, uh, where he airballed the. <laughs> he had one against the Pacers too. <laughs> uh, one of those sequences, um, but yeah, I mean, I I I I think that they need that bench lineup more. They they're going to need more ball movement, and I just don't know that putting RJ in there is the is. The best way to make that happen. Um, it also hurts Obi, actually. Like I think it hurts Obi a lot because because you're not using like again, this is just what it is. I'm not saying right or wrong. Like you you're using Hartenstein as the role man. So Obi and, and Obi is not being used in that context, so he's constantly just spacing the floor. Um like But you're also not getting out in transition. Right. They're not they're not um and Obi had to play with a big last year and he he was really I think part of it is Obi coming off his injury is like feeling like, things out right now feeling things out new new players he hasn't he's not always familiar with um I think that you know a more of an open ended uh, more of an open passing game I probably the last Nick fan still on McBride Island but I think he's cap- I think he was he had a couple of nice games where he's shooting the ball with confidence. Um, but I, I, right now I just don't love RJ with that bench unit, but I mean, it just, it feels like it's the same fucking thing. Every game they get a lead, they play well, they build up your hopes. Then they had a 10, how many times have they had a 10 point lead in the fourth quarter? Another one yesterday, they missed just enough free throws to lose the game. Um, they get fucked by the refs all game. Uh, and I'm just tired. I'm, I'm, I am tired of people saying, well, you know, like they had their opportunity. Here's the thing, right? I get why people have that mindset because in your life, you should have that mindset, right? That if th- things are, the world isn't fair, blah, 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 you still have to persevere. We don't play for the fucking team. I'm watching this to get some enjoyment and it's every fucking game. It's the same thing. So don't give me that shit because I'm like, guess what, right? If I tell you, right, go run a race with a bunch of people, but you have to wear a 150 pound backpack and you lose by three seconds. And, and then I'm, I tell you, well, look, you still could have run faster than the other guys. Fuck you. You know, like, uh, I would have run a hell of a lot faster if you didn't put that fucking backpack on me. Um, and it's just, it's not fun. Like, what part of that, like, we were going to win again. And it, it I mean, how many games? There's five, six, seven games. They could have 30 fucking wins right now if they weren't getting dicked over every time. And part of that, I do, I do not know why they they insist two for four again from Jalen Brunson, six for nine from these guys are somehow 80% free throw shooters, but they managed to miss the biggest ones in the biggest games. You see these free throw lines. I don't know when they've met me free throws, uh, but I'm fucking tired of it. Um, you know, our shout out RJ Barrett. He did go 10 for 11. Um, oh, quickly, quick, quickly got one seven of seven. And he, he had the, well, he's a, 
This this is like the one I I got a he lot of five fouls too. By the way, that fucked the Knicks as well because he could only play twenty one minutes. I doubt RJ would have had to play forty nine if quickly wasn't in foul trouble. Yeah, I mean, I thought at least a few, the a couple of those fouls were dubious to say the least. Yeah, um, yeah, and I I just want to say this like Van Vliet bullshit. By the way, yeah, I've generally been a fan of Van Vliet for most of his career, but man, was he like so much cheap shit yesterday, man. Um. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, the the one thing I got a lot of pushback on this, and I. I really don't understand it. I'm actually going to try and look up these stats right now, but I thought the Knicks, I thought Tibbs had an opportunity to close that game with a small lineup and he didn't. I didn't Did love it. Yeah. Like I, I thought, oh, look, really? he, he brought in quickly for one possession, quickly drew foul, got to the line, made more free, free throws, but that was the only possession offensively where they played that small lineup with Mitch off the floor and it's Brunson, quick Grimes, RJ Randall. Um, I believe that Mitch came in at that free throw, the second at, in, in during that free throw sequence uh, for Brunson, and like, look, this is not a knock really on Mitch, but like, that was a game where he was a problem in the fourth quarter. They, the, he was all over the floor because the Raptors were playing five out, right? They were putting Barnes in the post, and for some reason the Knicks just kept aggressively doubling on him, which I didn't think was useful, really. Um and you can just Mitch, put Mitch on Barnes to be honest. Yeah, or really like, yeah. or or but like that so like then you have Mitch trying to like scramble around on the perimeter. He couldn't do anything. So if you're gonna do that, then you have to play a smaller lineup. That's just a fact. Like Mitch, well, Mitch I think was, the, the I mean they did the Knicks did have 20 offensive rebounds yesterday. So I think the, the sure. hope would be that you make up for it on that side, right? But like I just I think there's a consistent issue now, and we've seen this now in a few games. When teams go small or they play five out, whatever you want to call it, at the end of a game, Mitch struggles. He's not great in that alignment. And if you like you need to adjust there. Like you have if you're not gonna because the Knicks fourth quarter defense, I think that's by far their worst quarter defensively. If you're not going to get stopped. Which it shouldn't be, by the way, right? Because I haven't we always been told that hey, the fourth quarter is ISO all day anyway, right? So I would imagine the Knicks are very unique in that their fourth quarter defense is the worst beyond just like fucking lottery teams. Yeah, no, I, I just, it, it's just really frustrating. Cause I'm like, I, I don't, yesterday was just a game to me where it's like, like, again, I, I'm not really interested in like, this is not like me killing Tibbs for this because I, I totally understand why he wanted Mitch out there. Like I don't, it's not a stupid decision or like, Oh my God, how could you do this? Right. Um, But like, I would have, you know, I would have liked to see. I would have liked to see that small lineup out there a little bit more. And people were like, "What well, you're going to get killed on the glass?" The Raptors are getting so many rebounds. And I'm like, they were getting those rebounds with Mitch on the floor. So, like, like, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that uh, you know, like, what what is yeah, that if actually? If it's mean? that's the thing, right? If you're if it's you bet if you're going to play big against a small team, I don't hate that. Um, I think. For this, for the exact reasons why I think that if a team is killing you on the glass, you might have well, well, as well go small, right? Like this is why I wanted to go small against the Pacers in that 2012 series. Like anyway, if you're getting beat up by by Roy Hibbert, counter, right? Um, don't fight fire with fire. You know, fight something else. Um, and um, but if you're gonna do, if you're gonna whichever shot, you better you better make sure you win the thing you're supposed to win. So if you go five out and you get killed on the glass, you better make sure you're shooting the ball well and you're scoring. And if you go big, you better make sure you're dominating the glass. Yeah, and uh, just, I thought this was a regression from both Randall and RJ. R- Randall and RJ, I thought, had um, – I mean, I, they, I think they racked up – like, Randall had 15 rebounds, but I thought this was one of his poor rebounding games in recent memory. Uh, he's been much more attentive. There were a few where he just watched Siakam walk in. Um, I mean, to be honest, like, I just have a hard time really – the guy they played so many minutes, especially Randall. Randall played what forty two. I'm talking about Detroit. the first half though. But yeah, second yeah. game back to back. But, but like, I mean, I like I said this at the time. Like, I really thought in that first half. So they they played Detroit at one on Sunday, and then they had a three o'clock game yesterday. That turnaround is pretty brutal, um, especially like midday game. Like, it's already weird, right? Um, I just thought in the first half, like sometimes you're, it's e- like you need five, six, seven, eight minutes to like get your legs back when you're playing. And that it, that's what it looked like to me. It looked like they were not just Randall, but like like they just all collectively looked a little bit sluggish to start that game yesterday. Uh, and then if you remember, like by the, the second quarter when they all came back in, 
they had they had their like they they were back in it like they they, they got their juice back they they leave they seemed a lot better about it so like I, I just kind of chalked that one up to like and I agree with you he didn't have a great rebounding game yesterday but it's like it's one where I'm like I kind of just yeah. let it no yeah and that, like, that's cool. also why I'm saying it is we got on him a lot for not boxing out earlier this year I still think his boxing out technique is more just bump a guy right or like get in the way more than really putting a body on him um but it works that's all he really needs to do as long as he doesn't just watch the ball that's effective for randall um by the way real quick i just want to mention this so yesterday the knicks uh in their minutes without mitch on the floor they had an 80 percent defensive rebound percentage and a 43.8 percent offensive rebound percentage um with him on the floor uh the knicks had uh, they had a 78.8 defensive rebound percentage and a 35.5 offensive rebound percentage. So, like, and look, I know Hartenstein played some of those minutes, so you still had a big on the floor. But, like, my point is more like, I don't think Mitch was, like, this was not, like, a singularly dominant Mitch rebounding performance. And I would have risked, I would have taken the risk to, to go small. Again, I get why Tibbs didn't, and I'd, like, you know, I think it's a totally reasonable choice that he made. Um, but like, I just I really like that lineup, man. Like, and and I I just think that there's there's something there. Like, again, with, they played one possession together offensively. Brunson gets in the paint easily, swings it to quick because they had to double down on Brunson. You've got somebody wildly closing out. I think I forgot who it was on quick. Quick blows by in baseline and is able to draw the foul on Ann and Obi at the rim. But it's like you just see how much more space Brunson has in those lineups. Like, forget everybody else. The fact that, like, when you give Brunson that much space, you can't stop him from getting inside. And once he's in there, he it, like his decision making. It's so much easier for him to make decisions when it's not Mitch and Randall. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's just so much more space. So, um, I would have liked to see that more. And I think that that would have been a really tough matchup for the Raptors because, as bad as Brunson shot yesterday, he didn't have a problem getting to his spots. Um, and I, yeah, I just would have liked to see that. And I also like, I just look. I, I just trust Quick. I think he's him and RJ yesterday, especially, were really good at the end of games. But like, I think Quickly is at the end of games. He's pretty consistently to me one of the. He he might be the best decision maker on the team in in terms of close game situations. Who do you just trust to make, you know, good decisions with the ball without the ball? On that note, I I probably still would go with Brunson, but Brunson is he has more guns, so to speak. Right, he has mm-hmm. more options. Like Quickly does not have that. He doesn't have the scoring package he has, right? right. So, yeah. so Brunson's decision making becomes simplified, but I do think he's general. And I, by the way, I don't have a problem with the the pull up three he took late. Oh yeah, I I don't know anybody that has a problem with that. Like I saw people like Mitch was open. If you watch that back, he's gonna have to throw like a full like a three quarters of the court pass over Siakam and somebody else running back towards to a Mitch. guy who shoots fifty percent from the free throw line. Yeah, so and it's also like Mitch there. doesn't and Mitch doesn't have the like great. It's not like he's. Randy Moss, right? Like he's not just he fumbles the ball a decent amount. It's not like he's got the best hands in the world. So he's not Nerlens Noel, yeah, he's not Randy. Yeah, Moss. he's not. Yeah, he's not Nerlens Noel. Uh, but like, yeah, it's it's it is like again, you get an open pull up three for a guy that's I think he's forty percent for the year. Like I'm taking that. I don't care. And for a um, win, and in a game where the Knicks were clearly gassed. Yeah, I'm right? I'm, and, I'm totally fine. Trouble. I'm taking that shot a hundred times out of a hundred. I'm fine with that shot. And I, I, I'm quite honestly like I remember this actually reminds me like last year there was that huge argument right over like Jimmy Butler taking the pull up three against Boston, and like I didn't have a problem with that then either because to me Boston was the better team, and it's like going for two down one when you're you know when you're yeah, at a, it, you're unlikely to win in the next overtime right so, right so i'm like i i'll I, and i understand butler's not a great three point shooter but if i'm i was but fine Brunson with that. Is, so yeah, yeah, really exactly. good one so. right and that's my point is like if i'm fine with that for butler and i was i thought that was crazy that people were going nuts about that shot i'm 100% fine with that for brunson like i, I think that's a great shot and it's and people are like oh well you should have called a timeout it's like guys again i i'm not like we can just say that Tibbs is not the best uh, hey, after timeout is. play designer here. So, like, you get an open pull up three for your best player, best scorer, best shooter, whatever you want to call it. Um, you got to take that. And I'm fine with that. And I got no problem with Brunson taking that. And I have no problem with Tibbs not calling a timeout. So, um, yeah, look, I, I do think like this game, though, to me, in a lot of ways was encouraging for the Knicks because I think this is a game last year, if the same exact stuff had played out for the first 
quarter, two quarters, three quarters in terms of the officiating. I don't think I think Randall would have had like a mental breakdown and probably gotten himself tossed from the game. I like he he did have that happen earlier this year, right against Sacramento, where he thought he was getting a bad whistle and he was getting a bad whistle, but he got tossed from the game. So I think I don't think he's um, gotten a tech since then, by the way. So credit yeah, maybe to not. Randall. No, 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 no. Uh, Breen and Clyde want to make sure that we give credit to the refs for not teeing up Randall. Um, they showed so much restraint for that. Like, I, can I just say, I'm so sick of Brian and, Breen and Clyde. Like, they, like, I love those guys, but I'm so sick of them defending refs. Every, like, every call, oh, well, see, he has, his hand was, you know, touching his shoulder, and he grazed his, his hair here. And it's like, guys, like, it's okay to just say the guy made a bad call. It's yeah. fine. It's ridiculous. Like, they were literally crediting Scott Foster for not teeing up Randall at the end of the game. It's like, really? We're going to credit him for that? Great job. You fucked up every call tonight, but you didn't tee up Randall. So, good work, Scott. I hope you hope you made your money back on this game. Hope you can pay for fucking rent, you asshole. Um, but, um, but so, I, I think that you know, these games are just getting really frustrating to watch. They're 25 and 20. I should be happier. But, um... I well, they should be, say- like, 28 and... They could. They should at least be twenty-seven and eighteen. That's I mean, that's this, really frustrating. Like yesterday, this game, Chicago, Dallas. Well, the uh, Chicago and Dallas, Dallas ones are really frustrating because I. I mean, Dallas was, was another Dallas one. Is, this one wasn't that different from Chicago. Missed free throws. Uh, the refs goal. weren't out to get us against Chicago. That makes me more mad, right? That's yeah, the right. right. That, that's, that's that's what I'm saying. Is like like this game is like like it's a loss and it sucks, but I'm. At you some think that the refs are not always going to be out to get us. I, yeah, that's like, what I was like, saying. I think yeah. that the Knicks are a tough team to officiate, and they don't have the re- they don't have a star that gets the respect of apparently Scotty Barnes or Fred Van Fleet. Dude, Scotty and, Barnes, man, this guy. I'm so happy I was always on the he's an overrated fucking loser train because I don't know how we won Rookie of the Year. First of all, Cade was better Kade because was nobody, better. nobody. I'm convinced of this. Him winning Rookie of the Year proves that people don't watch basketball. Like, how do you watch? Like, you can't have watched Cade last year and watched Mobley last year and then watched Scotty Barnes last year and been like, well, Scotty Barnes is the rookie of the year. And not just that he's rookie of the year. Shit, Franz people, had an argument over yeah, Franz people, is better now, clearly. Yeah, Franz but... is way better now. But people were calling Scotty Barnes like a generational prospect. Okay. Like, there's, I'm sorry. Like, even if you thought he was rookie of the year and you thought he was really good as a rookie, which, like, he was a good rookie. He was, what, 15 and seven, whatever he was. He was a good rookie generational prospect like what are you watching like wh- what do you see this guy can't create anything off the dribble he is an overrated defensive player a massively overrated defensive player top 30 percent three-point shooter can't yeah, finish there's, there's nothing about this guy that's generational okay by the way i want to i want to bring this up because i do think this is worth bearing mentioning okay um i mentioned that i would like to see that rotation with grimes and barrett be switched uh they're going to read off these numbers. Quentin Grimes and RJ Barrett have played 472 minutes together. They have a plus 2.95 net rating, 122.51 offensive rating, uh, 119.56 defensive rating. Okay. Uh, Emmanuel Quickly and Quentin Grimes have played 423 minutes together this year. Plus 13.13 net rating, 117.92 offensive rating. One, And that's without RJ Barrett on the floor. So Quentin so Grimes, RJ, yeah, plus 13.13. And you do uh, with, that without... Brunson on the floor. Next, sorry, yeah, I can do that actually. Where you're, let's keep going. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I can do it right now and keep keep it alive. But, but yeah, like plus thirteen written at rating. Yeah, with quickly and Grimes on the floor and no RJ Barrett. How many okay? minutes? Four hundred and twenty-three minutes. Oh wow! Over uh, two seasons or over just this? Season? Just this season. I can do last. Oh wow! Since last season too. Uh, s- quickly and RJ together on the floor. Four hundred and nine minutes played. Plus one point five eight at rating. One twelve point seven nine offensive rating. One eleven point two one defensive rating. Uh. Quickly, Grimes, RJ together. All three of them on the floor. I've only played 46 minutes, which seems insane. Um, they've only played 46 minutes. They're a plus 12.86 net rating, 100.98 offensive rating, 88.12 defensive rating. Neither of those numbers is sustainable. But uh, the encouraging thing is they've only shot 18.75% from three in those minutes, and their opponents have only shot 15.91% from three. So even if both those numbers come back up to league average, you're probably looking at a lineup that is looks like it is it's promising, right? It's promising and looks like even with average shooting on both ends, that should be a plus. All my point here is more like I think one, I think quickly needs to play more. And just consistently, and Tibbs has been, I think yeah, yesterday, yep, yep. yesterday he would have played thirty minutes if not for the foul trouble. Yep, hundred percent. Tibbs deserves credit for that. Uh, and then the other thing is, I think Tibbs is over. He's putting too much of an emphasis on 
RJ's shot creation next to quickly instead of valuing yeah. the two way synergy that I think quickly and Grimes have, which is really good. Like I think, or, or RJ needs to figure out how to play better off the ball. I think RJ and quickly were good together last year because RJ was doing more of the off ball stuff. They're running him more. You know, I think they have good chemistry in that pistol. Now it seems like RJ is creating more from standstills and quickly's watch it. Right. I think they were also at better synergy last year as well. Uh, another stat on kind of so I, to the argument that I was making even earlier that I would I wouldn't mind seeing Brunson, IQ, and Grimes together, especially since Grimes can defend threes and IQ. So in about 200 minutes, just over 200 minutes played, so smaller sample, IQ and Grimes without Brunson have a plus 13 net rating. Um, it's worth noting that opponents are shooting 25% from three in that time. So Probably not that great, but they have a 113 offensive rating. So it's not like the offense is really struggling with IQ and Grimes out there. Um, opponents are probably shooting better than on twos than you'd expect because a lot of those minutes are with Hartenstein. But um, is this know, quickly in Grimes with with the, Brunson on with, the bench? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just looked that up too, and I think like again, like there is an there is a natural synergy to how quickly and Grimes play together on both ends on both ends of the floor. Like there there is something there with those guys. Uh, I. I really think they should consider switching that up or change the rotation, stagger it differently, whatever, however you want to phrase it. But like, I you would can even really... try more Grimes on ball stuff too, right? That's yeah, probably I... something like, I, I'm not saying like a lot of people, I've seen people say he played point guard in college, quickly sucks. Why doesn't Grimes play point guard? Um, I think that it's more like side pick and rolls. Like they cannot go under against Quentin Grimes ever, right? Mm. Um, I don't know if he can split a double team yet. He, I don't know if he can deal with hard hedges. But a few times a game with a favorable matchup, you, you need to be. You, he needs to take more than five shots. That that's, um, you know, that's it, it's it's like it, it, he's their only shooter. You know, it's. I mean, there's just tons of football analogies, right? It's it's like if they leave a guy in man coverage all game and you target him once, um, you know that that you you just you you can't do that. So um, it's like if you I have really, a mobile quarterback and you just don't use him to run the ball for the first two and a half quarters of the biggest. Yeah, game of especially the year. when the team is. Fucking loading up the box. When you run a <laughs> trick play that was used, that is pretty full circle, though, isn't it? That like the first time I saw Philly Special in a game, greatest play in a championship <laughs> game I'd seen. I went nuts. Came full circle to use it, and I knew exactly what they were fucking doing. I was like, God damn it! Everyone in the stadium probably. Knew. I it was so obvious. I mean, I, um, but um, yeah, and then and then yeah, it, I guess fumbling inside the one is a Harbaugh trademark now too, right? Um, but um. I just come back, so let's progress on that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about this um, Fred Katz article. Um, Which one? The, the one about the blown leads. Um, oh, yeah, I know. You can't – it's just luck, dude. You can't blame him. You can't blame anybody. I think, it's just I, how it is. I think it's a well-written piece um, with, with help from uh, from friend of the pod, Seth yeah, Partnow. Look, pro- propaganda tends to be well-written. <laughs> Uh, I don't think Seth Partnow is in the uh, Tibbs propaganda business. So. Well, I don't think he is, but I don't. But he didn't write the articles. So. <laughs> um, but um, but anyway, the, the essence of the article, and a lot of people have brought this up. Um, the the essence of the article is that um, the Knicks have, at the time it was written, the Knicks had blown seven double digit advantages and losses this season. So that's eight now. I, uh, that's eight. That was after the Bucks game. Um, I I just looked it up on StatMuse. I can't confirm it, but apparently the Celtics have blown the most leads. But in when this article is written, the most leads were blown by Portland. Um, the Knicks were at seven, which is still if it's um I think only seven other teams have only seven teams had blown at least seven double digit advantages. So you know, fourteen have blown at least six, and twenty five have blown at least five. It's actually pretty freakishly linear progression there 7 14 21 but um but um you know one there's st- that's still two extra losses over um the other teams um uh, but the, the idea is that there's the three point thing i do uh, some of the questions that came up for me were like well how many of those double digit leads were in the first half because if it's the first half that i think the thresholds like blowing a 23 point lead in the first half against atlanta is different than blowing like a twelve point lead in the second quarter against Philly. I mean, right? is like it that though, Philly they, game, they, I wouldn't have considered the Philly game a blown lead. They, yeah, they yeah, collapsed yeah. on the stretch, but that was a better team that stayed with them. But like, um, but like, how many times have they been up ten in the fourth? How many times have they been up where they just have to hit free throws? 
I still think that those would probably be a higher rate. And this is not to, to get out for tips. I think the question is, because, I mean, you're, you, you, you bet, right? You dabble in gambling. So, and the reason why you talk about the refs, too, is for the same reasons you mentioned it, how much predictive power we're trying to figure out is if this is really fluky, at some point the Knicks should start winning these games, right? Or win them at a more normal rate. It doesn't mean that now they're going to win all of them. It should mean that going forward, they shouldn't lose this frequently. So just real quick, I misspoke earlier. The Knicks' worst quarter by defensive rating is actually this third quarter. They have a 118.7 defensive rating in the third. That's 27th in the league. Uh, in the fourth quarter, they're actually surprisingly good. Um, so I think I would like Relative to... Relative to the rest of the league? Yeah, they're actually pretty good. Uh, so in the fourth quarter, the Knicks have a... One second. Uh, these are all on NBA.com, by the way. Uh, their defensive rating is... It's not great. It's average. They're 14th, 110.8 defensive rating. But like, I, I think... Um, you know, I would like to see the numbers on this. I would imagine they've blown a lot of these double digit leads in the third quarter. And so then all of a sudden you get into tight fourth quarters and it's like, you know, it's like a, it's a variance thing where like, I I think the variance in play in the fourth quarter is probably just a variance thing. Like I, I don't, I do think it's probably random and, or not random, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's, you would expect over a longer period of time, the Knicks to Right. Or win those games at the same rate as everyone right. else. The the biggest issue for me is the third quarter. Um, and like I think I think there is something to be said for like Tibbs, as we know, is very much like a this is what we do and this is how we do it, and we do that for 48 minutes. And if we do it well and we execute it well, we're gonna win the game, right? We can live with the result. And I think most I, I think there are coaches who can take advantage of that coming out of halftime where they can make adjustments and you know that bears out with the numbers right so like is that is that is that just a fluke or is it a characteristic of the team that is being influenced by how their coach approaches things i think it's the latter there are good sides to what tibbs does and there are bad sides to that the good the good thing is i think we get off to good starts in games because we have a very defined, like, this is what we're doing. But I think in games, when teams adjust, um, that's a problem. I thought yesterday, like, again, the, the Scotty Barnes stuff in the, in the third and fourth quarter especially was ridiculous. You don't need to aggressively help on this guy in the rim. He'd have the ball, like, 10 feet from the hoop with five seconds on the shot clock. You don't need to send, like, a help defender and leave Siakam and OG and Obi wide open in the corner for threes. Like, no, just just stay at home. Like let him and and yeah, the other thing was and that was also that's not a thing that if anything the Knicks have probably played straight up more. That was just a weird. I don't even know if that's a Tibbs thing. It was just a weird decision. You know? I think it was a Tibbs thing, but like, well, it, it's a. I, I'm saying it. It was obviously a Tibbs directive. My point is like doubling it, when in when in doubt, double the post. Like even I mean he's left he left them in single coverage on Embiid a lot, right? So yeah, and, and so what I would say is like, um, you know, with Tibbs, it's. I don't think he is like there's just like so the way to think of it is like there's situational basketball, right? So if you're up ten with whatever five minutes six minutes left, whatever the hell it was, your goal, like I am so like I thought about this for a long time, right? People are like mid range is inefficient. It's not good. But I think oh in a shorter time frame there are there are times where the mid range can actually be a very, very valuable tool offensively. Like if you have a 12 point lead with eight minutes left in the fourth quarter, a wide open two point jumper is probably a better value because it's a higher percentage shot. Than I also like, don't think anyone says wide open mid range shots. Are bad right. Enough. But like, I'm saying like, like, all right, Brunson, if I'd, I'd rather him take him an in rhythm mid range jumper with a 12 point lead with like five minutes left than Oh my God! I have an inner mid-range jumper, but let me swing it to like RJ for a somewhat open but probably somewhat contested three. You know, like that to me is you're playing. You need to play the situation, not just the shot chart. And so, like for me, it's like okay, what what's the quickest way for a team to get back in the game? It's a three. Like wide open threes are going to be the way for them to cut the lead quickly. Or free so, throws, but yeah. Or free throws. So so. Like, I would much rather have Scotty Barnes have to make five consecutive twos and have them have to make five consecutive stops 
to close a 10, a 10 point deficit rather than we play our scheme regardless of the situation. And we live with what we live with as a result. You it's, know? it's not even their scheme to double like that on the only guys that like they doubled hard in the Philly game, which um, not in the most efficient way, but like you understand doubling James Harden, uh, but they've generally lived. I mean, they doubled Luca because he had 60 points. And also, like they did, a, they should have won that game. I had no problem with the defensive scheme in that Dallas game. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but so it's, I don't even think like doubling Scotty Bar. I wouldn't say doubling Scotty Barnes the tips. It was just a weird decision. You know what I mean? Like, um, but I mean, I think getting back to like, so getting back to the cats piece. So I think it's worth noting. Yeah, like there is a lot more randomness. The three point shooting matters. Um, I think there's probably some nuance and some the fact that the Knicks have both been unlucky and have kind of and probably have a style that hurts themselves a bit more than other teams late in games. But even if you don't want to buy that, I wonder if there's so many teams that blow leads, then there have to be a lot of there probably are some teams that are adept at getting back in the game. The Pacers. The Pacers are yeah. really, really good. Yeah. And and what do the Pacers Pacers have a lot of? Shooting. Yeah. Um, and the Knicks don't have, or they don't use their shooters like that, right? They they really have one reliable shooter. They have two, the Brunson and, and Grimes, but Brunson has to create. Um, quickly, if he gets going, which I think he will, I mean, he's been shooting the ball better of late, but even yesterday was one for four from three. So quickly right now looks like a 35% three-point shooter at best, and he's shooting worse than that. I think he's capable of more than that. I obviously think, I think you do as well, but they don't have a lot of shooters, and they don't get them looks. So I wonder if, yeah, we get the benefit, or we, we we get screwed by blown leads, but we never get the benefit. We never the shoe never ends up on the other foot for us, you know. Like, have we had like one like comeback like that this year? We had Maybe one or two against Philly. In Philly. Um, yeah, Philly without um, without Embiid and Harden, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm and that's not. I'm not. I don't. Know, I don't say that. There are people who have just like ripped the Knicks, but like every game they win is yeah. They haven't beaten a lot of good teams. I, like that's the thing. I see everyone make this comment. Who have the Knicks beaten that's ahead of them? You know what? No one. But they have twenty five wins. I mean, they that's beat the Cavs. All they, that's the one team, right? The Cavs. Um, so uh, the Cavs, who apparently traded for the greatest player in the history of mankind, who the Knicks were stupid to not uh, light their entire. All, future all I will say is that all I will say is I think the conversation about this team is like, and I don't look. I want to be very clear about this. I don't think we have the top end talent that you do. I don't think that the upside of this team is what the upside of that team's was. Um, but the conversation around this team, if you look at all the metrics, but then you look at some of these late game blown leads and results they've had, it's a lot like Boston last year. Like Boston, had, yeah, it was a, this, yeah. it, it's, it's a lot. Like I remember going, like, I remember this. I remember last year, like, and it's worth of, noting Boston has two, has one of the more gifted isolation scores in Jason Tatum and another really good score in Brown. So it's like, yeah, it's not they didn't have star power. That's why they lost close games. You know, but, yeah, but. and and no, and I was just gonna say like, I think if you go back and you remember like what the conversation was about this team, but then you look like I remember the conversation was like, oh my god, Brown and Tatum don't work together. They keep blowing all these leads. This team isn't, you know, they're they're not growing. They need to they need to make a move. Um, and I was probably one of those people who thought that at the time, but if you, I remember looking at all their metrics, like all of them, net rating, shot quality, all that shit. And you're just like, and even like shot quality against, and you're like, man, this doesn't make any sense. Like this team is, they, they're like top 10 by every metric. And they're sitting here with a 500 record. Obviously the Knicks have a better than 500 record, but like some of it might, it might just be a bad, bad, bad luck. in some of these close losses, it really could just be that. And in the moment for us, we're like, anal and I'm, I am guilty. I'm probably guilty of this. So I'm not trying to like act like I'm above it, but I, I think some of this might be like, we're in the moment and it's hard to not get caught up in it. Like, you know, like, you know, I, I remember like, I look, the, the bills played the dumbest football game. I think I've ever watched in my life this weekend. They ended up winning somehow because the dolphins had, they suck but like in the moment i'm like oh my god the defense fucking they're not getting it done they're... and then you look, go back and watch you're like well like like one of the touchdowns is a fumble six you know they they stopped them on a short field like four times tell them to field goals like it, it probably was a lot better than i think and i would just wonder like like look i've gone back and watched a lot of these next games 
it's harder in basketball to know exactly like what is a good, you know, what's a good closeout, what's a bad closeout. That's a very subjective thing. Um, what are the what whose rotation was that? These are all like very, very subjective things. But like I do wonder if there's if you know, maybe by the end of the season, right, we'll be sitting there after 82 games and we'll be like, yeah, I guess we just had a really weird like run in the middle of the season where we lost a bunch of close games that we probably shouldn't have lost, but then we got our, you know, then it evened out by the end of the year. Will that happen? I have no clue. Um, I think the Knicks are still two games behind their Pythagorean uh, win loss. So like they're, they're still a little bit behind expectations, but like they also have a tough schedule coming up. And I think there is something to the fact that they look a lot better against teams in their weight class than, to Milwaukee. Well, they've looked good against Milwaukee, but it always feels like against Milwaukee. They just can't close out those time. games. And it's like, and it's but like, I think like against a team like Milwaukee, we haven't played Boston yet, have we? Uh, yeah, we played them once. We lost We one played them once. It was a blowout, right? Yeah, Reddish played that, so it doesn't count. <laughs> well, the point is against those, like a team like Milwaukee, every time we have a lead, I'm like, I'm really encouraged with how they're playing. But it's it also feels like a matter of time before, you know, Milwaukee kicks it to another gear and the Knicks can't match that. Well, see, like for me, every time we watch Milwaukee and we play them, I'm always worried. Like, it's like they what they want to do offensively is collapse the, the defense and kick out for threes. Yeah, and that's like what we're <laughs> ready to do. So we're Lucy, I just, go, we're like Charlie Brown kicking the Lucy football, right? And yeah, we just we just need to Lucy. like, and, and this is what I mean about like situational defense. Like, I just think you need to be able to switch it up sometimes. Like, like. Don't like just run, run, play Randall to five, switch everything for two minutes. You know, d- start blitzing for a couple minutes. Play Randall and Obi together and have them blitz, pick and roll. Like, just try a few things, throw some wrinkles in there. And like, it's it, it doesn't even against the be... team that's playing zone, right? Throw right. in Svi for a few minutes, right? See if you can yeah. get some shooting. I mean, maybe Svi is just the worst defender in the history of mankind. If you can't get shooting on the floor, and it's especially against like a bench unit, you know, put a shooter out there. Yeah, I just I, I just think like it's not I I I actually want to say like I, I know there's been a lot of uh pearl clutching over the minutes lately and I do understand it and I do think it's like pretty extreme. But I actually like I've been pretty encouraged the last two or three games in the sense of like Tibbs has actually weirdly tried some things. He just hasn't stuck with them in the second half, which I think is him being like that it's it's when it gets into that like closer to the end of the game, you can kind of sense he's so desperate for the win. He doesn't want to like deviate from what he feels is the best thing to do and that he's confident in. But like against Detroit, for example, he played Obi and Randall together at the end of the first quarter for a little bit. And I thought he like, I I liked the rotations in that game in the sense of like, I, I like that he has Brunson play in that fourth quarters. Now, a lot of times at the start of the fourth quarter with quickly, like I like some of these things he's doing. I just think he needs to find a way to buy Brunson, especially, but also Randall, like another like two, three, four minutes of, of rest. And like, it's like one of the things I've been thinking about is if he doesn't trust Deuce, okay, so be it. There's 144 minutes between the three spots, right? One, two, three. If you just play like Brunson quickly, Grimes, RJ, they that's an average of 36 minutes apiece. So if, you know, RJ has to play 37 or whatever it is, but, like, all those guys should be able to get plenty of minutes, okay? And I think you should get a little freaky and, like, try OB at the three. Uh, I don't mind that. I don't mind trying OB at the three with Randall. If you're, like, if you need, like, I would rather bump so up. Tibbs is too Puritan. He's not kinky enough for you. Yeah, he's not, he's definitely not kinky enough for me. Um, But, like, I would like to, like, I, I think, if if he's and he doesn't have confidence in Deuce, and he and I get why he doesn't have confidence in Deuce because Deuce doesn't have confidence in himself right now. But like this, this to me is like where I would like to see him just be a little bit more out of the box and just try some shit because I think Obi has things that we could really use with this team and could give us a little bit more offensive juice in those minutes where we're kind of struggling to find shit. Um, so play him more at the four, play him at the three with Randall, play him at the four next to Randall at the five. Like, I don't care, but you got to find this guy more minutes. And I just think you need to like, you know, like again, the backcourt is if he doesn't trust Deuce, I get that. And to me, that's a front office thing where it's like, okay, you've got some contracts, you have picks, you have some shit. You probably need to go get another guy 
so that he can move Deuce back to situational bench, whatever. And, you know, now you have a ninth guy and that brings some balance, everything. He doesn't have to ride Brunson as hard as he's been riding him. But like, that sounds pretty freaky. Yeah, it does sound pretty freaky. But Obi, Obi's got to play more. I don't care. I, I know that he's going through some shit, but like one, I think a lot of that has to do with how we're using him. And two, I just, I don't care. We need to find out what this kid has in more minutes. Play him. Play him through some bullshit. Play him through his good times. Whatever it is, you can play. If Randall's going to play, however many he's playing anyway, you can cut Hunts. You can cut some minutes from Hunts, and you can cut some minutes from Rand, from Mitch. I think especially you can cut him from Mitch because Mitch, to me, when he has to play more minutes, he's not able to to sustain the impact over like when he gets thir- over thirty two minutes. I think he really struggles. So I'm fine with limiting Most him. Bigs are the like I don't think yeah. Rudy Gobert plays much more than that usually, right? So. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is Rudy but Gobert now, but like I mean, so, all right, no, so you're, right. Like, you're right. Like a guy like Aiton, what is he average, right? He's not playing on 35, 40 minutes. No, and I think I think the, we saw this with the Pacers for the longest time with Hibbert, right? Like, Hibbert would play like twenty eight minutes. That was it. Like he couldn't play more. Uh, well, yeah, you're right. Most bigs aren't able to play as many minutes, and that is totally normal. So, like to me, this is that's like the the opportunity, right, to play Randall with Obi, and we've seen enough from that group where like, is it always going to be good? Probably not. But are there nights where maybe it swings of three or four minutes stretch in your favor. Yeah, I think it could. So like, it's worth it to try that. If, if, you know, for no other reason, other than to get Obi on the floor more and up his value, if need be for a trade down the line, but like he needs to play more. Um, and I do think like, if there's anything I would be really critical of Tibbs for over this last stretch, it's probably that. And like, look, people can sit here and be like, well, he's got to play deuce more. He's got to find value. He doesn't, he Reddish is done. Reddish is never playing anymore. You can sit here and cry about it. It's not gonna happen. He's done. So he's not part if of the only rotation. quickly passed him the ball and didn't fucking hate him. Yeah, right. That's the real issue. But like he's done. Rose is a corpse. We've I've seen enough. Like we saw he gave Rose a chance, right? When Brunson was back out, was out of the rotation, was out because of an injury, and RJ was out. He had to play Rose. Rose was terrible. How was do you know that good. Tibbs just doesn't hate Rose and has a grudge? That's true. Stuff? Could be. 48. 48- <laughs> not good like he's given these guys opportunities and maybe if you want to argue that you know they're struggling maybe because of how he's using them and the way he's running the offense that's fine but like that is what it is that's not changing so like at that point if you're the front office you need to go get somebody that he does trust that can fit into whatever the hell he wants them to do is that eric gordon is that gary trent jr is that malik beasley i don't know but those are the type of guys that they probably should be looking at and that they can get without paying an exorbitant cost. So um, I'm at the point where I think this is like somewhat on the not. I think it is on the front office. Would you worry if they get a guy like Eric Gordon or Malik Beasley? Would you worry about Quickly's minutes now getting back to 20 minutes a game? Or uh, you know what? I'll say this: I don't. I actually think Tibbs has demonstrated in this stretch. I think Quickly is like one of his guys. Like Quickly is one of the like I thought in the beginning of the year he was being really ch- weird and shitty with. Quickly's minutes and roll. And, but like, <laughs> do, you think, do you think Tibbs in like 15 years is going to be coaching some team and going to bring back quickly as like yes, the old might. vet? And then like there's going to be some young point guard who's way better, but there's, he's starting the corpse of Emmanuel, 38 year old quickly. And it's it, like, it could, that it everyone happen. hates quickly. Yeah, it could. Like, but like, I think the way he's talked about him recently, I think he's called him like indispensable to the team. And you know, the way he's talked about him recently, obviously, he's like gushed about him. So, like, I think that he, I think he's always understood that quickly is valuable to the roster and to to the team because of his versatility. I think part of, but I don't think I don't think was... I think there's a difference between knowing it and then like fully appreciating it and committing to like, okay, this guy, every time I throw some shit at him, he just figures it out. Like he figures out how to be a plus player. And I think this year, especially like, I mean, that stretch without Brunson and RJ, um, like I thought quickly aside from Randall, like he was our best player. I didn't even think it was that close. So I mean, the, the question is like, if you get a guy like Malik Beasley, he's not playing 12 minutes a game. Right. And part of what has given quickly the extra minutes is that Deuce is limited. Right? I don't think Deuce even played in the second half yesterday. He hasn't played in the uh, second half the last like three games, maybe. <laughs> which opens so so quickly gets all of the backup one and two minutes essentially. Well, um, so like this is so what he would this... not he would get the backup minutes at essentially only one position if you get a guy like Beasley or Gordon. Right? I, maybe would, Gordon I would, would I would guess that RJ's minutes would come down because I think Grimes would get more minutes at the three then. 
So, so let's say, so let's pick one of those guys. I think Gordon is probably the cheapest because of age. Yeah, definitely. is that fair to say? Yeah. So let's say they get Eric Gordon. I don't. I think Gary Trent Jr. is going to be is going to cost and probably overcost. And, and I don't uh, think they want to. I don't think they want to because he's a he'll probably going to opt out. So yeah, he's going to have so to free. get a new That's contract. That's the whole reason he's getting traded. Yeah. Um, and then Beasley's intriguing. We can get to, get to that in a second. Let's assume they trade for Eric Gordon. What would you see the minute split? Just do the one through three positions. All right, I will do that. But before I do, the NFL playoff picture is locked in, and my go-to place for wildcard round action is DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. To kick off the road to Super Bowl 57, new customers can bet just $5 and get 200 in free bets instantly. Plus, all new and existing customers can get a no-sweat bet each day of the wildcard round this weekend. Just place any NFL bet of your choice, and if it loses, you'll get a free bet back up to $10. Action so good, why bet NFL playoffs anywhere else? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code TBPN. New customers can bet $5 on the NFL and get 200 in free bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code TBPN. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Um, so I would say, let me just, so that's 144 minutes we're talking about, right? Okay, so I think Brunson gets... I, oh, I, I mean, but there's only there are some restrictions. Quickly can't play the three, and Grimes yeah, 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 and RJ yeah. can't play the one, right? Neither yeah, that's fine. Gordon, I think. So, yeah, yeah, trust me, I would not want any of those guys to play the one, uh, even though Tibbs might randomly want to play RJ at the one. Um, I don't think anyone's done that since Fizdale, right? Yeah, the first game of his career, fucking <laughs> idiot. Uh, I would say 34 minutes for Brunson. I quickly would... gets 14 as the backup one. Yeah, quickly gets 14 as the backup one. I think. Grimes goes 32 and RJ goes 34. So how many minutes are left over? Uh, so that's 16 and so that's 30 minutes left over. Okay. So if you want quickly at 30 minutes a game, he needs to get 16, which means Eric Gordon's only getting 14 minutes a game, which maybe he's fine with since he's not. I mean, I would, if, if he can get out of Houston and play on a playoff team, I'm I think sure he'll he be fine like with that. it. I think he'd be oh, fine so with it. I also don't know that it happens because he's Eric Gordon. He's a vet, and I think Tibbs might trust him. But so that, but that is just the way you see it out. That like they get one of those guys, but that guy just is still not prioritized and, over a guy like quickly. You know, and like this is the thing is like this is where I think Tibbs' rigidity actually hurts you. Is like this wouldn't even be a problem to worry about if he would ever just try like RJ at the four and Randall at the five, right? Because that naturally opens up minutes. And it's not like he's playing Obi a shit ton. Like Obi's already getting fucked, right? So it's not like it's not like that that screws him over anymore that it already that he already is getting screwed. So like this wouldn't be a problem if he would be a little bit more flexible with that. Can he? I mean, he's actually I I would actually re encourage people to go back and listen to his um post game after the Washington game on Friday. I, I, he must have he must have been in a he was in a really good mood. That's probably the most fucking relaxed i've seen in a while but he has a girlfriend in dc sounds like yeah he might be um or boyfriend but, mate or yeah, uh, you know he, he you know you can always uh you can always pay for action in dc uh but like i think that he he mentioned specifically like that small lineup he liked that it could switch more he liked some of the things about it so like again this is this is always the weird thing with tibbs where it's like he clearly understands the value of these things and what the benefit can be. It's always about, can he get to the point of trusting it? And he hasn't shown that consistently yet, except for like the biggest moments of games. So this is like the Frank Neal thing where it's like, I don't trust you for 47 minutes a game, but you're my guy. When I Go guard Trey Young with the game on the line. <laughs> go, go lock him up real quick for me, Frank. But it's just like, like this is always the weird thing with Tibbs, where he clearly understands the value of specific things, but then executing on it and following through on it is is difficult for him. So, um, yeah, and, I, and just for, yeah. on Eric Gordon specifically, he's averaging. So he's thirty four years old. So I think there may be some truth to the fact that he wouldn't even mind kind of a, a more reduced role. Um, but he's played. He's averaged thirty minutes a game this year. Uh, on a team with that's obviously trying to prioritize a lot of younger players in the same kind of position, um, he's played essentially 29 minutes a game the last four years, um, and you know, so he he's never been in a limited role. Um, would he accept a more limited role, given that he gets to be on a contender? Um, I don't know, 
But and I would imagine Malik Beasley is in the prime of his career, so he's looking for his next contract. Uh, I don't know that someone like that would be willing to to take a reduced role. And and I think the other thing is like, well, you know what? The bench is not lighting it on fire with quickly. Uh, you can argue that he should be given the ball more, and maybe that would help. But um, the fact of the matter is, as things stand, they need help there. And if that comes at his expense, this is a team trying to make the playoffs, and they can't be sensitive towards those feelings. Um, Malik Beasley actually averages fewer minutes than Gordon, who's only playing 27, 20, He's only playing twenty-seven minutes a game this year. Uh, but again, you know, I don't think he would come here. So that I, I, I mean, you see the issue that I'm bringing up, right? Like, it, it quickly his minutes become a little bit challenging to maintain. Um, and for all the, the shitty things about the bench kind of lacking some teeth, that um, you know, that's been the one positive, right? Is is quickly been getting more minutes. Yeah, and like, I'm actually like this is this is like one of the weird things where I think one of our main concerns was if quickly is not getting minutes, is he going to be like? is he just going to like try to get the fuck out of here? And I do think that was a valid concern coming into the season. Um, but like now that he's getting, I, again, I never thought the issue was starting versus not. I, I always thought it was about minutes and, and to Tibbs's credit, he's closed multiple games with him too, you know, at the expense of RJ or at the expense I think of he would have closed yesterday if he wasn't in foul trouble. Yes, I think the last two games he had went over yeah. RJ. So, yep. so I, I think that like, I think if, if you ask quick if he's happy with his role, yeah, I mean maybe he'd like the, a chance to really start, but like I like myself in my role. Yeah, he's the he's perfect, right? He's the fourth guard now, so it's great. Um, but like but that role would change if we were to acquire one of the guys who I do think would help. Don't get me wrong, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the balance you have to figure out here is like what is the what's what price is worth paying to marginally improve this year. Like, honestly, I don't, I'm not really interested in making the type of move that's like, that your goal would be, well, if we make this move, we need to win a round in the playoffs. I just want to make a move to make sure we get into the playoffs. Right? Like, like I don't think Eric, given, yeah. like, I don't think Eric Gordon is going to like, change our fucking future or anything. I do think that he would, like, like let's be, let's be real. Like, he he's gonna call, he'll cost the first probably, right? He'd probably I don't cost think so. The I don't first. think so. Who's going to give a first for 34-year-old Eric Gordon? Um, a protected first, like a heavily protected first, a team that like a team like well, Boston doesn't have any left, right? Like so, one Boston, of those teams, Boston would have to trade a future one. They're not going to do it. Like any team, like you're, we're talking about contenders, basically, right? That's who you're yeah. talking about. Okay, Denver doesn't have any picks to trade. Uh, Boston, Why? they've traded all of them. But what? Oh, like for Aaron Gordon and stuff like Aaron that? Aaron Gordon. Wow. They traded another one this off this past off season. They've traded a lot. Um, Miami, they're not going to do it. Uh, two. I mean, Miami's not even a contender. Philly so if, doesn't have picks. Yeah, yeah, they don't have picks. Brooklyn doesn't have picks. Well, Brooklyn has Cleveland like one pick, but yeah, Cleveland doesn't have picks. Like the, it's like Memphis. Memphis has picks. Are they going to do it? Phoenix they have has a lot picks. of guards too. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 maybe if Memphis is moving on from Dylan Brooks or something, but yeah, but then it's like, why are you getting? You know, like how does Eric Gordon fill that void? I don't. That doesn't really make sense. And <laughs> and also, you're not going to trade. You're not going to trade. Picks. New Orleans has picks. Are they gonna? Do they want? Does Eric Gordon want to go back to New Orleans? And does New Orleans want to have Eric Gordon back there? I highly doubt it. He's got a chance to the ring. <laughs> I I am skeptical that did, did he was he literally did he hated in New Orleans. He told them because they so he got traded there right for for Chris uh, Paul for Chris Paul Chris, and then when he was a free agent, he signed an offer sheet with Phoenix and told New Orleans he like begged them to not match it. They were like, okay, dude, that's cool, but. We're gonna go ahead and match it <laughs> because what the hell are you talking about? But he didn't want to be there, and I mean he's a pro, so he kept his head down. He actually had a couple good seasons there, but like he was not, you know. He, I don't think that's that's gonna happen. He'd be good it, in Dallas. He'd, he'd be good in Dallas. Of, yeah, they yeah right. So it's just like they have. I think the Knicks. I'm not saying they're in the driver's seat because, as we know, after the Donovan Mitchell thing, I don't want to. The Knicks aren't in the drive. Like they have a decent shot. I don't think there's a team out there that's gonna give up a first for Eric Gordon. Um, and I do think the Knicks could be like, hey, look, we'll give you Reddish, we'll give you Rose is expiring, and a second round pick for Eric Gordon. Like, what are you realistically getting that's better than that? If you're the Rockets, you're getting like a decent, like a prospect who maybe you can. You suck, so maybe you can like you have the opportunity to give him minutes and see what he has. Uh, Rose is expiring, so you save money on Gordon's salary for next year. 
Maybe you can buy him out, save a couple million because he's going to go sign a vet min somewhere. He's going to make twenty million dollars next year, by the way. Um, Gordon. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And and guess what? For the Knicks, I think that's perfect because then you have Gordon and Fournier together. That's like thirty eight million dollars of expiring salary. That's I think the Knicks want that. I think they that puts them in position to now for for somebody for I mean if if a star became available that would at least already like you're already there almost with salary right that like you're in the mix and I don't want to like we'll see what happens we'll see who the cat let's say that like a Devin Booker for whatever reason he became available so now you could say a lot more likely now than it did a year ago yeah Yeah. right but like I, I don't know what his what Booker's number is but I think I'm pretty sure that like now you'd be like, okay, Gordon Fournier's expiring he's salary. A free agent. No, he's a he already signed an extension. Um, those I mean, two guys. Be, when is so he's locked. He's up not a free agent until forever. I'm just saying. I'm just giving an example of a guy. But it's like Trade, you, yeah. could, you could include those two salaries and be like, hey, we'll we'll make RJ Barrett the centerpiece of this deal, uh, and you give us Booker. We'll throw in picks, obviously, and that's that's the, like. I think they, he would cost more than Donovan Mitchell. So I think it'd have to, it'd have, probably have to be two of the young guys. And he's one of the guys I would, I like, Booker. I mean, I hate Booker playing against them, but I think he's a, he's a better yeah. player than Donovan Mitchell. My, or he was before this season. I, I think he's better than Donovan Mitchell. I think he's better than. Oh, well, Mitchell really Mitchell is shooting at like a Steph Curry rate almost and um, defending. Will both of those things last? If they do, then I think it's a real conversation. I would have said it was not a conversation before. This Dude, year. the Suns are playing at a 13 win pace without Devin Booker this year. They are terrible, and he's like he had them as the one seed. Um, I think he's. I mean, I think I mean, he's what's what's Mitchell shooting right now? He's shooting over forty percent on like eight threes a game. I like, look. I know. I know the percentages are crazy. I just look. Like, I'll I think always, the question is, do you think it can last? And I don't yeah, know. and I and I just quite. I just think that like Booker is. I think he's a more polished all around scorer. He's also um, a more versatile defender. Like yeah, he's size. a more versatile. Yeah, I think he's like, playing good on defense this year, but yeah, he's obviously going to be two positions at most. And I think I think Booker's actually become like I'm not going to say he's a really good defender, but he's like solid. Like he's fine. He you can. I actually think he is a really good defender. Yeah, but I, yeah think like, he, I think he's he, yeah he's been better than Mitchell, and even now like he can guard probably three positions pretty competently. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, but yeah, like I I just think like so that's why I, I so I. I'm actually pretty interested in Gary Trent Jr. Um, like, I think he would be an interesting addition. But like we talked about, he's going to be, be a free agent after this year. I don't think the Knicks want to give out. You know, you're probably going to have to give him like a, a three-year deal maybe. He's 23, so like that isn't a huge concern for me. But I don't think the Knicks want to do that and then have to figure out how to move him later, or package him later, even though it's weird to me because I think he's a guy that actually retains value pretty decently. But like, like yeah, I don't he's think he's going to be what he's going to be. Like, yeah. I while. don't think, yeah, and I don't think they want. I just don't think they want to have to enter into like a contract negotiation within the summer. Especially like, look, this free agent class sucks, right? He's probably one of the best free agents on the market. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're like, okay, well, yeah, we'll do like, you know, we'll we'll give him three sixty million, three sixty five million or something, and then some team comes in and is like, yeah, we're gonna give you four a hundred, and it's like, well, fuck, like, <laughs> do we will actually want to match this? Probably not. So um, I think that's. That's why I would suspect he's not in it. And then the other guy is Malik Beasley, who is on the market. I don't know. Like I, so I'm, I'm like, I am actually curious to get your thoughts on this. There's a couple of things that are interesting. I was talking to Jeremy about this today, Jeremy Cohen. Um, you should definitely not follow him. He's a fucking idiot and doesn't provide any valuable insight on basketball or the salary cap. Um, but he he mentioned Eric Gordon is 91st percentile in half court offense. I'm not exactly sure that's calculated. I think that's half court points per possession. Um, whereas Malik Beasley is 64th in half court points per uh, points per possession or her percentile, however you want to say it, 64th percentile in that. So and Eric Gordon is playing on a team that doesn't that pass. sucks. And yeah. So yeah. Um, so I wonder, and but like my my main concern with this with Utah and with with Malik Beasley specifically is. Like they run a very motion heavy, you know, ball swing side to side. Everybody's touching the ball in possessions. Like it's a very egalitarian ball movement, player movement heavy offense. He's playing well within that system. He played well in Minnesota last year. Minnesota, at least last year, from what I saw, they moved the ball more than than we do. Um, I worry Minnesota. a little. Bit. <laughs> yeah, I just I worry a little bit about like. So 
is he benefiting from the type of offense he's in? And also, if you put him on a Knicks team where the ball isn't swinging as much and he's probably not going to be touching the ball as much and he's probably going to be more of a spot-up guy. Does he he, Quentin Grimes rule. <laughs> I mean, forget accepting it. I think he would accept it. But is he as effective? Do you get the same player out of that? Because, like, I never, I'll never forget this. I think it's like one of the most interesting things. I remember, obviously, back in the day when like there was that whole summer, right? Where it was like, should Golden State trade Clay for Kevin Love? And it was all these things. And I remember reading that like one of the things Jerry West said was, you don't even know how good Clay is going to be because we've been like with Mark Jackson as head coach, we were running this like very stagnant, ISO heavy offense. Um, but Kerr's going to come in. We're going to have a lot more ball and player movement. And when you see how good Clay is, when we start doing that, like you're not going to want to trade this guy. Okay. And so like, obviously Malik Beasley is not Clay Thompson, but I do wonder if some of that also applies, right? Where it's like, he's benefiting from playing in this like very, very different system to what the Knicks are running. So how does he translate when, if you bring him over? Um, and I'm just curious because like, I, I think like we've seen that with Hardenstein. Hardenstein's a guy who played in a very, very different scheme last year on both ends of the floor really um and was used very differently on offense and the fact that the knicks have restricted what he can do offensively which you know again i, I tend to think that like hartenstein has to adjust and that's just on him at a certain point um even if you want to say tibbs is hurting him but like there is something to um there is something to that uh with with beasley i think um yeah so that, that's a fair point um Beasley is also at 26 uh 27 and he has a he has a team option for next year so assuming if you trade for him you're probably going to be exercising that option uh real quick just want to clarify this Gordon is 94th in 94th percentile in half court offense this year uh and Beasley is where is it at uh yeah he's like 61st any benchmarks there from the Knicks? No, I can try to ask, though. Oh, you, those are just the only two that you have. Sorry, I thought you were looking yep. at the list. Okay. No, uh, no. Um, yeah, it, that'd be helpful to know just, like, um, what it's being added. Um, another guy – so, but you would – it sounds like what you're – you're looking at a bunch of 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guys, and you're saying the biggest need, it sounds like, is shooting. And in Eric Gordon's case, he gives you some shot creation, too, right? I think he's an underrated defender, too. He's a good. He, I think he's a good defender. Um, yeah, but um, he's thirty-four. Um, probably not a long-term piece. Um, but you know, there is another defender who may be available, and an awesome defender who I would personally love to watch with Emmanuel quickly, uh, or Quinn Grimes, or even Deuce, um, who also shoots thirty-nine point five percent from three, albeit unlimited attempts. Uh, is that something you might be interested in? Uh, I might be interested in that. He looks like Caillou as well. Uh, he's a pain in the ass for Knicks to play against. Um, but it sounds like you're not, you wouldn't be super into Crusoe probably because of the volume three point shooting. So here is, I'll throw this back to you. If you trade for Caruso, do you think that a reasonable argument could be made that while he doesn't provide shot creation, that his ability to run point? could allow quickly to actually increase his usage in more of a combo guard off bar off ball role. I think we've seen who are the guys that quickly has shined with, right? They are usually guys who can play both on and off the ball. Burks is an example and quickly plays really well with Jalen Brunson because Jalen Brunson is known for ISO, but he's actually a pretty good off ball player too. He had to be to play with Luca. Um RJ Barrett last year I really liked the synergy he had with quickly because they were both moving without the ball much better. This year, RJ has been a little bit more, um, you know, slowed down the ball a little bit more. Um, so I and and I we we've, we've both talked about the Knicks look better when you add connectors. That's really a lot of what Grimes has added. Like you talk about the shooting, but his decision making is able to drive and kick. Um, that helps. So Caruso brings all of that. I think Caruso would be great next to quickly because he can play both on and off the ball. It's not so much that he moves quickly off the ball. And it's not so much that he can play next to quickly. We have a lot of defensive flexibility, right? Caruso can guard one to three. He can pass. He can bring the ball up. So you can do some more off-ball stuff with quickly. But he can also sp he can spot up. He can hit an open three. He can cut. 
Um, yeah, I think that he would be a really good fit for that. He's he's what we would want Deuce to be, essentially, but obviously bigger and a lot better right now. Yeah, I, I it's it's a weird one for me because I do think we need more of a gunner, but like again, there is the argument that quickly can do that more and maybe he might even benefit from like having to balance less because i i do think it's like i i really i don't know if people really grasp how hard it is to do what quickly is doing which is like he basically has to toggle between two sometimes three different roles within a game um and he's managed to be effective in all of them and it's like yeah there's like there's there's a six three guy when we've talked about this like there's not a lot of guards that that are weapons on and off ball right like and i like i'm not saying he's in the this class of player but like you're talking about steph or like brunson yeah mitchell brunson that we have now um fred van vliet even though he only apparently shoots well against the knicks uh but like the like Kyle Lowry at his best, like the guys you're talking about. I mean, think about those names. Like those are all guys that feature heavily for excellent teams. So I think if you're going to do a Caruso deal, the argument, like the pitch to me would be like, no, no, this isn't going to this like his lack of shot creation usage, whatever you want to call it, isn't going to be a problem because we are going to now get more out of quickly. Like he's going to get more shots up. He's going to be more of a scoring focus for us. Um, but you know, I look, this needs to be and adding another plus passer could get Obi involved as well. More, right. So and, yeah. And, 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 and I think, I still think that like when Grimes is out, when he's off the floor, point of attack defense is still like a relative weakness for this roster. You don't think so, Deuce has been good at that or. Deuce I think Deuce has struggled game. lately. I just think Deuce is in his own head. He, he's just like, he. I, he's really got to fix, like, he just needs to, sh- like, he's not playing with any confidence. He clearly doesn't want to shoot the ball anytime he gets it. Like, he's got to figure that out because right now he's just all over the place. Um, but, like, it needs to be said, Alex Caruso this year, 11.2 usage. Um, for his career, he's a 13.9 usage guy. That's a little bit low. Yeah, it, it's... Look, 13.9 usage it is what it is. It's not that it's not that great. 54 true shooting over the course of his career. He's had he's had a he's on a good season this year, 57. Last year he was only 53. But like this guy's a plus player. I mean, his on off, on court, however you want to rate it, all his impact metrics for his career are fucking great. Uh he has logged minutes at both point guard and shooting guard this year. I think he's big enough to check some threes. We've seen him check Randall pretty credibly. So like he is a, a versatile piece. There's value to getting this guy. I just worry a little bit about the offense. But like to your point, if if he just comes in and takes the deuce role, right? Not the role, but obviously he's gonna get more minutes. But it's like, you know, maybe even RJ benefits from that, right? Because I do think that like some of the issue here is Tibbs trusts quickly to run the offense in the half court, but he doesn't trust anybody other than RJ in that group to do it. I think he would trust Caruso. So maybe that benefits RJ more too, because as you were talking about, Are you saying he's racist. Yes, I do. I am. <laughs> no, but like, like as you mentioned earlier, like he's leaning too much into RJ creating shots. Maybe you get a Caruso, and he dials that back a little bit in those lineups, and that benefits RJ as well as Quick, right? So, you know that that would be the argument, and I don't think that's an unfair one. Um, and um, and you know he's he's young. He's so you, it would not. You know, if I think Eric Gordon's contract and how much of a plus that is would kind of, if you're deciding, I do. I mean, it, those are probably two more likely guys than the guys we mentioned, than than Beasley and uh, Gary Trent Jr. Is that fair to say? Sorry, say that again. I would have. I would think that Gordon is the most likely candidate. To your point, I think Caruso. I would argue is more likely than Nick, a Knicks target than Beasley or um, or Trent Jr. Especially. Is that fair to say? Uh, I don't know. Um, Beasley was somebody they were interested in two years ago in free agency. Um, like, really interested in. So maybe that's changed. Two years is a long time, and obviously they've made plenty of other roster moves in that in that period in between. So it's possible that, like, 
they don't feel the same way about him now, or they just don't think that he's a good fit anymore for what they need. But I do think that like, you know, look, he's CAA. Uh, they have connections with him going back. I, I'm not sure. I do think Eric Gordon is the most likely because I also think he's going to be the cheapest to acquire. Yeah. I mean, do you think Caruso would cost the first? Probably. I mean, I don't know who's going to pay it, but uh, he's probably worth it. Uh, I would, Especially I would, that contract. I would probably, I would be fine trading a protected first for, for Caruso for sure. Like yeah. he's 28 and he's on under contract for another year and uh, two. two. Okay. Yeah. So that's even better. And he makes less than $10 million a year. And yeah. Provides and, much more impact than that. So yeah. And he's, and he's going to be a guy who like you, you would, I would reasonably expect him to still be valuable for at least the next three, four years. Yeah. And I mean, the the pace for the Bulls actually goes down when he's on the court, but I do wonder how much he can juice that transition game, right? If he's forcing so many turnovers on defense, um, or just speeding up the, the the game with you know kind of pushing those push forward passes and all of that. And also, um, I think given his size, like we know that Tibbs, like Tibbs, he 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 trusts quickly defensively, but he also like likes guys. He likes to match size to a certain extent, right? So I think in that sense, Caruso gives him versatility um, to move guys around and switch matchups up, which I think is valuable. Yeah. I do say I do think Caruso is a better point of attack defender than quickly. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So I would probably deploy them like that, um, and I'd probably have then that frees up quickly to do more of the free safety stuff, which is what he's really. I mean, he, quickly is a good point of attack defender. But, or, but he's um he's really elite at the off ball stuff. Um, I guess the yeah, the, I mean the only worry at that point is that yeah, like quickly probably goes down to twenty minutes a game, right? Um, so you know, does that have an impact on the rest of the roster? I don't know. But if you're adding another guy who's like an advanced stats monster, who's like a huge impact guy, who probably helps quickly shine in that role. Maybe it's worth it. Um, and I do think the the defense. I guess I will say the defense with Eric Gordon. I do worry about trading for a 34 year old and having that be the solution because that hasn't really worked out for the Knicks. Well, it worked out with Rose, but you know, for a limited period of time. You know, Eric Gordon shooting 35% from three this year. He's had some bad seasons in the past. Um, I do worry about you know a decline at some point. So we'll see. Maybe maybe if they are going to play him in a more limited role, it becomes that makes more sense. But um, but yeah, it's tough to uh, tough to tell. Yeah, um, look, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to lie. Like it, I was really pissed yesterday, but I was not pissed about the team performance or anything. I actually was really... It just I felt hate, like a game we should have won, and it's just happened too many fucking times this year. Yeah, no, I I, 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 dude, I 100% with you there. I'm just saying, like, like I, I hate saying shit like this because it's like, who cares? Like, why would they care what I like? But, like, I was, like, really proud of them, actually, as a team. Like, I thought they fought through, they fought through a lot of bullshit yesterday. Um, and it's the second, the second night of a back to back weird times as we went over, like the fact that they, like, they could have given up at the end of regulation, right? They didn't. And, and it, they should have won in regulation. I think RJ makes that free throw. He, he was locked in. Um, I thought they were going to fold in the second quarter when they went down by like eight and there was giving up a ton of open threes. I was like, this doesn't look good. So yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I thought they could have easily folded at the end of overtime too. And they just kept fighting. I thought like I Randall didn't have a good shooting game. I thought he played a really good game yesterday. I did. Like, I know yeah. that we talked about the rebounding being not great, but I thought he competed defensively. I thought his passing yesterday I'm was actually say, like the rebounding was not great compared to what he's been doing. Right. Yeah. Like, so like, I thought he was, I think, I think he's probably the next best player yesterday. Yeah. I thought so too. I thought he was really good. And I thought his passing yesterday, I know he had a couple of, costly turnovers look again some of that is just like the limitations of what he's like the reality of what he is as a player and he was he was tired like whatever dude I, I thought he he gave you everything you could reasonably expect and you know what i really liked he took two shots at the start of overtime i think he knew that he was shot like he just didn't have it and he he deferred to brunson and to rj the rest of the way and like i actually thought that was like very that, sure. that was really yeah that was really good to see um like we talked about it, I think Brunson had a bad game, but like, guess what? I'm not. He had a bad game. That happens. Uh, I, I liked. I know. The, I, I we probably have a little bit slightly different, slight, slight, 
difference of opinion on how RJ played yesterday. I thought he played really well in the second half in overtime. Um, I, I really thought he locked in. I know that he's going to get killed and he deserves to get killed a little bit for not boxing out um, Scotty Barnes in that play in the, at the end of regulation. But like, I don't know. He played how he played a shit ton of minutes. Like I, I just struggled to like. Well, I think that was my bigger issue. Is I don't think he should be playing that many minutes in that role where he's on ball as much. It's more of that than RJ himself. Um, but um, but he also had some nice kickouts. Uh, I I liked. I mean, I, yeah, he had thirty two points on, you know, on a reasonably efficient um, shooting line. So. Um, you know, I just I just like the spots he was getting into in the second half. Like I thought he was really patient on his post ups. You know what I really like in the first half? He tried posting up Van Vliet, and Van Vliet um, poked the ball from behind him when he when he spun. And what I really liked is that he did the same move on him two or three times in the second half, and he learned from it. You could tell he was like he protected the ball better. He moved it out in front of him so that when Van Vliet tried, he couldn't get to it. I thought that was really good to see, and I just thought he worked to get to his spots really patiently. Um, and, and that floater, he had a little bit of it going yesterday. I think he still got one of the worst floaters in the league by percentage, but that's still way better than what he was shooting last year. Prez has talked about this extensively, like he's shooting it flatter, which is giving him a better percentage. It's good. I, I just think he's, he's playing in a pretty nice rhythm offensively. Um, I posted this today because I do think the conversation around him is, it's really weird to me. Like, I feel like every time he has a bad shooting game or bad shooting half, people are just like, oh my God, a hundred million dollars. You just can't be like... Like over his last 22 games, this guy is shooting. He's scoring 21.6 points per game, 5.9 rebounds, 2.9 assists, 45.6% from the field, 38.3% from three, 75.4% from the line, 56.7 true shooting, 51.9 EFG. Like, if you told me, numbers, if you told me before the season RJ was going to average 21 and a half a game on just under 57 true shooting and just under 52 EFG, I would have been like, great, sounds awesome. Um, look, the start of the year. Like it's it's so annoying looking at his numbers because that ridiculous five game slump he had, it, it was so bad. It's still dragging down. What in totality has been a pretty solid leap for him in, in terms of efficiency. Um, I think he's at fifty three and a half true shooting now for the season. So like, look, I, I, I I agree with all of that, and I do think like it's also annoying where like when quickly plays well with the starters. Oh, RJ's got to go to the bench. I like, hate that. I hate it's that. dumb. Like no, like you can play all. Through. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's dumb. Um, but um, it's good having guys that can attack in different ways. Like R.J. Barrett isn't going to score 32 in the same way that Brunson is going to score 32 in the way that Randall is going to score 32 in the way quickly might score 32 in the way Grimes, if he ever got enough shots, would score. Like you want guys that he can attack in different game. Yeah, he did. That, that was the game that R.J. and Brunson were on Dallas. But it's like. But the like you get what I'm like you want guys that can attack and score in different ways. I and think like, the issue comes with the fact that they use Rand, RJ in similar ways to Brunson and Randall. Like I, I like his post up game has gotten better, and it's a guy like Van Fleet. You like that matchup, but uh, I still like him slashing from the wings. I like him getting the ball on the move. Um, I like him um, spotting up. Um, I like him. I mean, you know, so like it's the pro- the problem is that we talked about this. Like when a Nick is ha- when the Nick has it going and they're hot, um, it seems like they get even they've done this with Grimes, right? In the thirty three point game, they're like, all right, give Grimes the ball at the top of the key. He's hot. He's like, well, that's not why he has thirty three points, right? Um, and I I just wish they I I wish they had RJ go with his bread and butter more, especially since they have at least one highly gifted isolation score and another guy who's been, who's been more efficient in the opportunities where he's, he's featured, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think that's part of him also figuring shit out. Like end of the day, like you pay the guy, what, 107 million guaranteed. So like whether right or wrong, the natural inclination for players is like, Oh, now I got to like prove I'm this caliber of offensive star or whatever. Right. And it's not perfect. I think he obviously, I, we've been talking about this forever. Like, I really think he, he should be a four or five assist guy. I really do think that. Like, I don't think that's a high bar for him. But the openings he creates with how often he gets into the paint, like, you're talking about, I, I don't even, I, it's really not hard for me to think of him making that leap. So it's frustrating that he, it hasn't happened yet. But, like, I mean, I, I'm, I think he's, he's, getting into a better rhythm. And I think that he 
has a better, he's a much clearer plan of attack now when he's going to the rim. There are still bouts of like annoying bad finishing and stupid decision making where he forces it up between guys and traffic and shit. But like for the most part, I would say that he's seen a, I think even quickly have shown significant offensive improvement this year. Yeah, and both of I mean, RJ is now up to a career high forty eight percent on twos, which a lot of that is that mid range improvement. Uh, I think the free throws going in is a huge help for him. Um, well, now when he misses a free throw, I don't expect him to just miss the second one too. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it, it looks like his touches has generally improved. Um, I think Drew Hanlon has talked about um, you know, them improving the touch, uh, particularly in the paint. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I'm. I, I don't know that I would say I was proud necessarily. Um, I think the Knicks are way past the point of moral victories against a team like Toronto. See, normally I would agree with that, but like when you're getting fucked by the refs, like it's it was one like because I like you know what I they, still, like, they need to hit free throws at the end of games. That's they need there's to, just it's too I don't many, know. It's too many fucking times. Okay, so like, how many missed, games have they lost because of missed free throws? I would I would probably guess it's not as many as we think. It's probably three or four at least. It's like it's basically Chicago. Did they Chicago, Chicago, Chicago for sure. Dallas. I don't think the uh, Dallas game is missed free throws. If you go back and watch that fourth quarter, so Rant Mitch missed. Mitch, I, I don't. Mitch doesn't count. Mitch doesn't count. Yeah, fair. Yeah, Mitch doesn't count. Deuce made like three or four or five of six on the stretch. Like I don't really consider that. Julius went two of six in the fourth quarter in overtime. But um, no, no. But the, I'm not talking I mean, about choking. I just need, they, they need to hit the fucking free throws. I, I, agree, I don't know if it's, it's random. Like, I, I don't. You know, it's to, to me the Dallas one you lost because of. Everything else other than free throw shooting. There's so much other bullshit in that game. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> yeah, um, seriously. Uh, like, they lost. I, I would argue yesterday cost them. I mean, that's the thing, right? Like in these games where you end up tied, and the other team gets back in the game because they're committing fouls to get back in the game, and you can't close them out. The last Toronto game, they didn't lose, but they, um, you know, it got close, and part of it was missed free throws. Um, there was the. Um, what was the game? There was Chicago and the first Toronto game. That the free throws didn't help there either. Yeah, that didn't. The, the first Toronto game. Did they miss free throws on the stretch? I feel like they just missed shots down the stretch. I think they missed some free throws too. I don't know. I, but you know, let's look this up. Let's see what are the next shooting from the free throw line in the fourth quarter. Let's see. I would venture to guess that it's probably not as bad as we think. That's going to be I, my guess. It seems like a lot of guys shoot below their average. Brunson in particular. Brunson missed two in that Chicago game. All right. Let's um, see. Randall was two of six against Dallas in fourth quarter and overtime. He's been a much better free throw shooter overall this year. He's had a little drop off recently, though. All right. So the Knicks in the fourth quarter. Hey, look, you're right. Uh, they're 26 in the fourth quarter, 75.5% from the free throw line. Uh, for the whole game, they are. I would venture there. I would guess they're much closer to. They're actually top ten. Yeah, uh, but it's not. It's like this is the thing. Guess what their percentage is? It's seventy-seven point eight. So it's like you're talking about. I don't know. I just. I really think that like I would bet by the end of the year we come back and look at these numbers, they will be right around their season average. I hope so. It's just, but it's annoying to keep seeing happen. I agree. I look. I I sit there. The Washington game was annoying. I don't remember if that was a bottom. That wasn't missed free throw. Randall missed one, right? But yeah, like, it, was, it also seemed like the Washington the Detroit games, and I think the first quarter of this game, the Knicks just didn't play with a lot of intensity. And the Washington game, I was both those games. I was fine with it because, especially the Detroit game, I was like, you know, like the mark of a good team is that like you're playing a shitty team, and you play bad, and it doesn't matter, and you win by double digits because you're just a lot better than them, right? But I do think like their intensity was lower against Washington and Detroit. Those are like not the games. It's more um, Chicago, Dallas. All three Toronto games have been frustrating because it seems like the Knicks should have won all three. Said they only come away with one, and all three ended up being close late in the game. Um, I, was, I fucking hate Toronto. Um, I respect they, 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 yo, I hate them so much. I think they play the most unwatchable brand of basketball. They are. They get away with unbelievable amounts of bullshit. Uh, I. They're just brutal to watch. They are fucking miserable to watch. Uh, and I. Siakam hope they, is very unlikable superstar. Whatever. 
Um, like I, if I have to see that guy fucking just like throw he up, he just I mean, spins around and like he just spins and spins and spins and then throws up some bullshit and I got a call out and of it. Yells. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so sick of them. I, I really, I really hope we fucking blow them out on their home court too. I just, um, I, I hope that we. I hope that they blow it up. I'm so sick of that team. I'm sick of everybody on their team. And I'm sick of how overrated everybody is on their team. Like, people are talking about OG Ananobi's fucking defensive player of the year caliber. What did he do yesterday? Who I think he, he could go first time all defense. But, well, he, 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 um, yeah, they didn't put him on Randall. That's true. They put Barnes a lot more on Randall, if anything. He, he like, and, and, he, like, I've seen RJ has given him work, which is like, look, I, I think RJ's making a, made a significant leap, but, if you're talking about this guy's a lockdown wing defender, like I'm sorry, bro, I'm gonna need a lot more than that. Like, I, I mean, I think you know I disagree with you there, but um, I think one thing that is worth noting is that we often talk about, you know, when we talk about we t- when we talk about offensive stats, it's very easy to talk about context, right? Like you talked about it even with a guy like Beasley. We talk about MVP conversation, or whatever, or whatever. It's like, well, this guy plays in better spacing, right? Or this guy is used in a certain way, or this guy gets to use gets to play, you know, in a spread pick and roll offense that plays to his strengths, strengths, whatever. Or he plays next to guys who draw double teams all the time, so he doesn't have to create. We never talk about that. We don't talk about that nearly as much on defense. Uh, the Knicks, I think, are the best example. You know, for early in the season or last season, especially, we talked a lot about how Mitchell Robinson um, doesn't, you know, lacks agility maybe against. A, a, you know, in the pick and roll against really quick ball handlers, or has to play more conservative and drop. Look how much better he looks when he plays next to Grimes and quickly, right? Then next to Fournier and Kemba Walker. Um, and so you talk about a guy like OG and Anobi or any of these guys. You play him next to Barnes, next to Siakam, next to Van Vliet, who's still a good point of attack defender. You know, like how much of that is his individual greatness? Right? <laughs> He's being put in pretty good positions playing next to. You know, a pretty a, a bunch of good defenders, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. I just I despise everything about that team, and uh, that was I, too fucking. Fr- it feels a little bit like the first tip season. We couldn't beat Miami, and we couldn't beat Philly, and all of those games went down to the wire. It feels a little bit like that with Toronto, where like it feels we should be winning these games, and it's just not fucking happening. So, like, there's, there should be three zero between these two teams. Yeah, I mean, we got to figure out how to close out some of these games, that's for sure. Uh, all right. I think that's a good place to end our podcast today. Uh, Stacy, let the people know where they can find you and plug anything that you'd like to plug. Uh, you can find me, Stacy Patton 89 um, Nothing to plug. Awesome. Uh, I have nothing to plug other than your mom, uh, but uh, I will plug all the work at the Strickland as well. I will plug all the podcasts. Uh, check out Draft Strickland. You know the the mailbag. Check out the rundown. Tyrese and Sam are doing uh, a great job on those after each game, and Jeff as well. Um, and check out all the articles and stuff that we got on the website. Uh, definitely check out any recap that's written by Matthew Miranda, by the way. All right, that is our podcast. any pod he's on. Check yes. out Matthew Miranda's pod that he don't posted. check out his pod. It's a bad pod. Actually, it's not his fault though. His, his <laughs> co-host is terrible. Uh, all right, that is pod for today. I hope everybody has a great week, and I will see you on Friday.